Well, uh, let me uh, start by uh, thanking the organizers uh, to uh, invite me to speak here and apologize in advance in case I sound a bit incoherent. It has to do with the fact that it's still pitch dark in Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, I should also thank the NSF for supporting our projects in various ways. And many contributors uh, to these talks, experiments, experimentalists as well as theorists, uh, on the left there, the ones in blue are either studying or working at Drake University. The ones in green do not. And then there are some who are sort of in a coherent superposition between working with us or at us uh, and somewhere else. So uh, this will be a, a pretty fast overview of recent work in our group. Uh, the, uh, you know, in the spirit of this meeting, uh, a couple of auto seconds per slide. So, um, but I will have lots of links uh, also to papers, to video talks uh, that we uploaded to YouTube. Uh, and also, if you are interested, uh, I'm very happy to uh, share my slides uh, with you. So there's a couple of topics, starting with an introduction. And uh, we don't really have to do much about this. Everybody here knows that. The difference between multi-photon ionization and tunneling ionization. I'm going to talk about both of those. Uh, the uh, Kellish parameter is the one that determines what happens. Uh, one other thing I'm going to talk about is the uh, so-called frustrated ionization, and that really is, is sort of a, a strong field process, uh, except that the, the field may drive the electron back, uh, and it could get stuck in a bound state. So computational methods, um, two things. One is very popular, single active electron approximation, SAE. Uh, there you have sort of a, a, a nice situation. You have a potential here for helium R times V. Uh, um, then you have a, a bound state orbital here and you might have a continuum orbital. So this is, uh, they are very fancy, very fast methods to, to solve this problem. It's very economically, uh, if you need to average over the carrier envelope phase or the focal point, et cetera. Right? Then the other one, we just heard about it. Uh, from Katarina, the RMT uh, method, which is a multi-electron method, is very computationally expensive. Um, Catherine Hamilton, who is now my postdoc, um, and so she studied under Andrew Brown in Belfast, and uh, she has a nice little uh, YouTube talk um, about the uh, the B spline um, the R matrix method as well as a project that she's doing with me, mainly to combine it with uh, Oleg Zazzarini's B spline R matrix method. We also have a very good collaboration with the group of Alexei Gunjamaila at Moscow State University, and they use time dependent perturbation theory uh, to obtain various parameters, and that can help uh, quite a bit as well. So, first topic: light induced coherent co quantum control. This is with linearly polarized light. We all know that if you have two pathways that lead to the same final state, but you don't really know which way you're going, you can get interference. And the, top, the first topic I want to talk about is something that we did a few years ago, where you take the fundamental and the second harmonic of a femtosecond XUV pulse from a free electron laser, and you try to control the photoelectron angular distribution. So here is the scheme, and then I'm illustrating it on hydrogen. Uh, so you have two laser pulses, really, and you have a mixture of the second harmonic, which can get you right away into the continuum. So here, for example, I show this for uh, atomic hydrogen. So it, it, the, the, uh, uh, if you start with the ground state, the second harmonic can get you right away over here. If you do it with the fundamental, you would need two photons. You can enhance the process by going uh, via a resonance state, in this case, the 2p orbital. And as Mark, for example, also mentioned in the very first talk here, the result of this is that your um, uh, angular distribution becomes uh, sort of there's a left, right, or up, down, depending on how your laser is oriented, the symmetry about this. So uh, what happens is, essentially, because of this, your photoelectron angular distribution takes you know, this general form, but in contrast to what we are sort of used to from standard photoionization experiments, is that there will now be odd rank uh, 
anisotropy parameters, these, uh, these betas here, beta 1, beta 3, and so on. And they lead to an asymmetry that you can measure if you look, say, for example, what goes to 0 degrees, what goes to 180 degrees, difference divided by the sum. And that is an asymmetry, and you can actually control this via the delay. So this was the ex experimental setup at Fermi in the group of um, Kevin Prince. It was published a few years ago in, in Nature Photonics, and uh, it was quite uh, an, an amazing uh, uh, experiment. Uh, of course, <laughs> unfortunately, they don't do hydrogen, but they use neon. Uh, my friend Tim Gay at Nebraska calls neon the devil's atom, and uh, because it's quite hard for theorists, uh, although RMT might uh, be able to help out. And then they use these guys as the intermediate states. There are two of these J equals one states. But sure enough, as a function of the relative phase of the delay that they could control to 3.1 attoseconds, um, I just read the paper again last night and they are talking about 900 zeptosecond uh, steps in, in, uh, in, in their um, delays. And so you see a beautiful uh, um, sinusoidal curve as a function of this relative phase. Uh, unfortunately, the blue line is a fit and not the theory, um, but at least theory be, be, uh, predicts that this should happen. Um, we then wrote two follow-up papers and we looked at the dependence of all this, what you could see as a function of the laser parameters. You get beautiful pictures when you look, for example, you scan the photon energy through, you might change the ratio of the uh, second harmonic via the fundamental. You can change the number of pulses and as I said, you get beautiful pictures, but at the end of the day, it is very, very difficult to compare directly uh, between experiment and theory for a system like this. Although, as I just said, RMT might come to the rescue ultimately. Um, I will also talk a little bit about, uh, or quite a bit about, uh, I should say, the overlapping uh, of an XUV and IR fields. We wrote a paper on that, and so the question was, can we do something like this, but then on top of it add an infrared pulse uh, so another it mixture. I don't have time to go into this, but in this paper, we showed that the answer to this question, can we get additional control, is in fact yes. And so of course what happens, and again we learned about that already uh, in uh, various talk just this morning, you get uh, sidebands, and if you have a strong IR, you get more than one, uh, and if you have a weak IR, you might just get one. And that's what I'm going to talk next, speaking about sidebands. Uh, this is an interesting paper. This is basically Anna Hart's idea. Uh, and the idea is to compare a uh, single sideband standard rabbit. We, we spell rabbit with two T's because we think the two also deserves a T. And, um, and then uh, with uh, center sidebands or other sidebands of a three sideband rabbit scheme. And the idea is to directly uh, extract information about the continuum continuum phase. So the details are in that paper, uh, but here's the scheme. So this is sort of a standard rabbit. You would make an APT, uh, after second pulse train, say with 400 nanometers in this case and probe it, and you would get what we just heard about, standard interference, but you can also do it with 800 nanometers. So in fact, here you make the APT, in fact, with the second harmonics. Um, and then you have a lot of pathways, uh, but you end up here, uh, you see that uh, there is a possibility again that uh, there will be interference because you've got lots of pathways and in fact in the middle you get something that looks very much like uh, what you are used from the rabbit experiment. I should say that it's also that these lines also oscillate, uh, but it's hard to see on this particular scale. So one can already see that this thing here might be very helpful. And the idea is to, to look at this and at this uh, in two different experiments, take the difference. It's a very, very challenging experiment. There's no doubt about it, but the idea uh, seems very nice. So let me just show you how this thing would look like. This is a computer experiment. We did it for atomic hydrogen. That's what we know how to do uh, very well. So you would get these high harmonics. Um, <clears throat> 
I don't, didn't label them all just not to confuse the picture. And then you have um, the side bands, the center side bands, they are the weakest ones. They have the best contrast, but the other ones uh, also exist. So you have lower side bands and higher side bands in between all of these high harmonics. So uh, as I said, they oscillate. In this case now, uh, because this is 400 nanometers, it's four times this, uh, omega p times tau. But you see, the thing is, what happens is there's two delays really. One is the delay between the IR and the uh, XUV. So this is this TD here. And then there's another one that one could write as delta uh, phi, or in the spirit of atto seconds, one would like to get a tau in here. And so what you see on this picture is the center sideband, the oscillation of the center sideband. And you see that this extra phase here, the difference to zero, that that kind of, it, it goes like a line like this. Uh, so the higher ones will have less of a delay than the lower ones. So here it's about 80 attoseconds. This is about 30 attoseconds. And one IR period in this meeting is 2,668 attoseconds. Uh, as I said, the other sidebands also oscillate. Here is one example of a lower sideband. The contrast is, you can see, it's, it's, it's not very good. Uh, so, uh, but it is possible to fit. Uh, Divya Bharti, who is a PhD student of Anders, did these fits. And so if you fit the highest energy sidebands, you get something like this. And you see here that this delay is just a few attoseconds. Uh, and you basically get the same information from the, the lower, the center, or the higher sideband, which is uh, in, important to check a particular approximation. If you go for the lower sidebands and you look really carefully, you will see that these sidebands do not exactly have the same uh, time information. Uh, there's a little bit, this is a bit more here, believe me, than this. Uh, so it turns out to be somewhere between minus 70 and minus 85 out of second. Unfortunately, you can also see that the fit uh, is not quite as good as uh, it was in the previous one. So this is where you have to, as an experimentalist, you have to take the balance about do you want a, a good fit, you want signal, and uh, all these little things that theorists don't have to worry so much about. Um, so here is uh, basically the results. So a typical example, and we make, uh, we, we look at this extra phase. So part of it comes from the APT, part comes from the Wigner delay. If these are the same in the one sideband and three sideband rabbit, then the difference, so this is a real challenge, right? The difference can give you access to this uh, continuum continuum phase directly. Then one can make an approximation to that, which is very complicated in general, but the approximation is you just add them up uh, for the various transitions. And there was a formula given by Markus Dahlström and collaborators, which was then used in this particular paper. And it turns out it's actually a very good approximation, at least for the high side bands. For the lower ones, it's not so much. And you see actually a difference here between what you would get from the higher and the lower side bands. Um, and uh, as I said, it's a very uh, challenging experiment, but it certainly can be done. Uh, we also looked at uh, what might be uh, happening in a realistic experiment. You might have chirp. And so again, the question is, is there a difference between this difference between the phases that you get from the, the various sidebands? And it turns out that this is very small. So that's good uh, that the chirp, these uh, are numbers that uh, Anna gave me and she said they are kind of realistic. So the chirp actually doesn't do much. There's a little bit that the IR chirp does, but uh, at the end of the day, this difference stays the same. So that's good. But there's absolutely no doubt that this will be a very, very challenging experiment. So uh, if we have a, a student who wants a challenge, sign up with Anna. Also, please look at Anna's and uh, Catherine Hamilton's Twitter posters on this particular topic. And in fact, the same Twitter poster and Catherine's uh, Daymop talk, which is now on YouTube, should be looked at because the experiment is actually planned on argon with 10,030 nanometers rather than 800 nanometers. But Catherine did a heroic 
uh, RMT calculation. Uh, and so uh, what you see here, in fact, is the difference that you would get um, if you do the best fit between a 400 nanometer and an 800 nanometer probe for argon and neon. And you can see what is required uh, to, to, to actually measure that. But we are assured by the experimentalists that, that they are going for it. So very impressive. Um, another thing I would like to mention is uh, an, an experiment that was also done at Heidelberg. And this is uh, the idea, uh, again, you have an XUV and you have an IR, you can delay. Here are the two uh, examples uh, of, of extreme cases. One is when the IR is late, the other one uh, when the two pulses are overlapping. And this is uh, well known that in principle, then when you have an overlap, you can have these light induced states where uh, you do something that you would normally do um, with, with the XUV, but then you absorb uh, one or two uh, or, or emit one or two uh, IR photons and you get that. Uh, Alan Bondi, who is a visitor at Drake, uh, gave a nice talk about that uh, at Daymog as well. So what can circularized pol circularly polarized light do for you? So this is an experiment that was done uh, also at Fermi uh, by Markus Ilchen, Michael Meyer and collaborators. And so they had a rather strong XUV pulse that can ionize helium, but the wavelength was tuned so that it could also at the same time uh, excite the ion to the 3p state with m equals plus one in this particular case. And then you can play uh, with the uh, helicity of uh, an infrared pulse and you need four or depending on the strengths five uh, to get into the continuum and so the question is what would you see if you change these helicities around and so here's a simple uh, scheme of this what you might see uh, the full lines here are sort of lowest order perturbation theory the dashed lines are higher order processes and so what happens? Now well, let's see. This is what happens. You get a peak. Uh, this is the lowest energy peak, uh, the rather low photon electron energy. You get an ATI peak. There is some kind of presumably noise in, in between. And so the question is again, so um, how, how does experiment in theory compare? So this one is helium plus ultimately, so we should do better than that. Uh, in, in general than for neon, for example. And indeed, uh, I think we are doing pretty well, although one has to say that we cheated a little bit on uh, uh, the pulses were too long. Um, there, there was not quite, the intensities were a little bit shaky. We didn't know, but overall it looks pretty good. And so the, the next thing then is to look at the angular distributions. And this is basically what you would expect from first order perturbation theory, and it works quite well. Right? So if you take co-rotating, you only have one spheric harmonic, really that does the job. In the other case, you may end up uh, with uh, essentially predominantly uh, coherent superposition of those two. These are the dominant uh, contribution. Uh, then we looked at the circular dichroism just of the main line, and there was a bit of a surprise. At relatively low IR intensity, uh, intensities, like about seven times 10 to the 11 watt per centimeter squared, we, we got what we expected from lowest order perturbation theory, namely that the co-rotating case dominates completely. So when you define the circular dichroism in this way, uh, the probability for the same um, ionization with the same uh, helicities compared to the, the difference over the sum, then you get this. Um, then what happens here is at you just double the intensities and you already get almost zero. Uh, and that was a big surprise at very high IR intensities. There is a prediction it should be negative, but we were very surprised at this particular energy. So what's going on? Uh, in this paper, we tried to explain what's going on. Uh, Alexei Gumzumaila really did a lot of work. Uh, it has to do with the quasi energy spectra. What happens? Uh, when you have this NIR as a function of, of uh, intensity. And what happens basically is that we are losing the target for the co-rotating case. And that is the main reason for this particular uh, uh, circular dichroism to go down. Um, I also wanted to talk about circular dichroism in lithium. This is the same idea basically, except now you don't need a free electron lasers, so you can almost do it at home. 
Uh, this is done at Rolla in uh, Daniel Fischer's group. Uh, the theory was done in, in our group. Uh, David Akushala is a, is a very good undergraduate student. Um, and uh, so uh, we just submitted an, uh, a preprint for the archive. So the idea is to prepare lithium in a trap uh, with circularly polarized light. And then you ionize that oriented state with circular polarized light, compare also to the 2S ionization, and you see uh, what the difference might be. So the interesting thing is that there is actually, what happened here? Okay, there it is. Uh, there is actually a possible application because you might be able to make electron pulses where you can switch the polarization within femtoseconds. And that could be used to study ultra fast spin dynamics in magnetic domains. Um, here is uh, sort of one of our results experiment compared to theory. And so you see the agreement isn't perfect, but it's, it's pretty good. Uh, and we again get a circular dichroism um, depending on what the intensity, uh, the peak intensity of the lasers are. And uh, so there is some broadening as we can see, but overall it looks pretty good. Um, David gave a talk about it. You can uh, listen to it on YouTube. Uh, last topic that I'm going to talk about is tunneling and frustrated ionization. Well, uh, thanks again to all the people who helped me out, uh, especially yesterday already on this. Um, so uh, most people will know this paper that uh, became quite famous in nature physics. And so what they did is they introduced this auto clock idea. And at the end of the day, the, the point is uh, that if you uh, measure this angle, then supposedly you might be able to, uh, to uh, figure out whether or not there's a time delay in photoionization. The problem is that the Coulomb interaction uh, plays a role and, uh, and that's uh, uh, a little bit of a disturbing fact because that already causes uh, an angle. And sure enough, if you take a Yukawa potential, Jan Michael talked about that yesterday, uh, you essentially sort of get a zero angle, but the reality is that you have uh, uh, several of these um, cycles, and so you get some of these bands, and that is a problem. Uh, nevertheless, the experiment was published. Um, there's good agreement between the experimental data and the theory. One might say, well, that gives confidence in both. As arrogant theorists, we would say, well, we solved the TDSE for atomic hydrogen, we know how to do that. So uh, it's good for the experimentalists that they got this. Um, the hope originally was that these results could be used to calibrate the auto plot for future studies on more complex systems. Whether or not that is really possible is a subject for debate, as we had yesterday, uh, because it turns out that it's not quite so simple to determine this particular angle. Uh, and so we found that it depends on how you, you, what your algorithm is to get this angle. You might have a cutoff experimental momentum, whether you take the maximum, whether you integrate uh, on some extent, to some extent also on the pulse parameters. And so I don't believe that you can predict this angle with a simple model for a Yukawa so potential. Indeed, it is basically zero uh, independent of those parameters. In the previous graphs, the same procedure was done and everything is fine. I would like to point out that Alex Bray made exactly the same point. If you took the first fringe here, you would get this angle. If you take the last fringe, you would take that angle. Uh, some of you may know that uh, the Brays and the Barshats are good, uh, good friends. I've known Alex since he was four months old. He's not my son, but I was ready to say, that's my boy. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. So we try to explain it with Bohmian mechanics as well. Uh, I don't have time to go into the details, uh, but if you are interested in, please read this paper. Uh, we then proposed to use uh, negative ions because Yukawa really is wrong for neutral targets on both sides. Uh, you need to change the, the Z near the nucleus to get it, and then at large R, you also have it wrong. So uh, we have this. We can put uh, the basic physics in it, uh, it was interesting, it took us a while to get this published and accepted because people said, well, in, in, there's no way on earth you can do the experiment, but that's not quite correct. In fact, Dag Hansdorp in Gothenburg in Sweden uh, just wrote a proposal to actually do it, and we can even put a bit more physics in. We heard from last month and yesterday about dipole polarizabilities and so on. And so this is our SAE result. It's very, um, um, 
it, it gives essentially zero. Then there was a recent follow up uh, by uh, our RMT friends, uh, and uh, they actually found a negative offset angle, but uh, uh, please read that paper in detail. So I want to very briefly at the end talk about frustrated analyzer, uh, tunnel ionization with linearly polarized light. And uh, so we just published a paper on this. Um, then we looked at the ellipticity dependence. There is a preprint uh, on the archive right now. The paper has practically been accepted. The idea was to test RMT against SAE. It works very well for this particular parameter. There's also a, function, uh, a simple analytic function by Alexander Lanzmann. And uh, that also seems to work. It's a little bit too narrow. There's a prediction from a Chinese group that says if you increase the length of the pulse, it goes up even to non-zero ellipticities. Not quite true when we checked it. Uh, and I should also point out that this, in fact, is not the measured signal uh, that we calculate, but we believe that the signal is uh, essentially proportional. And I should say these are all relative parameters, so it's a little bit, uh, one has to be careful about these conclusions. So summary, there are many systems that you can study. Much is done with SAE. Direct comparison of this experiment remains a challenge. Numerical calculations beyond SAE, most likely R and T, are coming. They are very demanding, and the interpretation is by no means obvious. And I should say that our group, we believe, is well positioned to perform a variety of calculations. We love to work with experimental colleagues, and so if you're interested, please talk to us. And Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Klaus, for your exciting talk. Very clearly explained, was really enjoyable to, to watch. And uh, now we have time for questions. I see already the first question uh, from Luke Rontri. And uh, Luke, do you want to, to, answer, to ask your question? Uh, sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah. And sure. Uh, on your slide about the uh, three sideband RMT, or, uh, three sideband rabbit calculation, sorry, uh, you made an approximation for the uh, continuum continuum uh, time delay. How do, uh, is there any physical justification for that approximation? Uh, well, that is a very good question. Uh, there are it's sort of an asymptote. It, it's a it's a fairly complicated uh, situation if you if you read the 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 Dahlstrom et al paper. Um, there may be other people in the audience who can answer the question better than I can. Uh, I don't know if Anna is is there. She uh, she might be uh, the best one to to answer this. But I don't want to put her on the spot. Uh, the uh, you know it, it sounds like. A good possibility, and it it's it works well. You know what? Uh, I I don't really uh, know enough about this to to really. Uh, no Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Uh, I have a question from from the from the audience. From Andrew B from QB is asking: Can you explain how the negative ion experiment will be done? How I can I explain it? Uh, Can you explain? Yeah. Well, yes, in principle, I could if I could uh, quickly look at the proposal that Doug sent me and ask for help. Uh, I, I have to be say, I, I, I don't know. They will buy the correct lasers for it. Uh, and apparently, he's very confident that uh, they can do this. Uh, the the, uh, the negative, um, the, the uh, ion affinity is uh, 3.1. Uh, 3.5 electron volts uh, for for these systems roughly. So you they, the idea is to use a, a long wavelength laser. Um, you know I'm not an experimentalist, so I, I honestly don't know how they do these experiments. Uh, I have a brief uh, eight month career as an experimentalist, uh, and I left the lab permanently in 1981. So. Uh, and that was uh, on, on something completely different. So I honestly have no idea how they do the experiment, but I'm amazed at what they can do. <laughs> uh, so the best person to contact is, is Doug Hanstorp. Uh, he, he, he wrote a proposal to the Swedish uh, National Science Foundation. Thank you. I actually have a quick question. Uh, can, uh, can you, if you uh, would have a chance to speak now to experimentalists, 
what would you ask them? What experiment would you like to see? Well, the biggest problem that we seem to have is, is not in the, what experiment would you like to see? I mean, we would like to see if, if we want to, sh to be bright as theorists, we want to see experiments on atomic hydrogen. Well, that's pretty hopeless, right? Very, very difficult. I wouldn't say hopeless. I mean, the people at Griffiths did it. Uh, the next thing is relatively simple targets. But on the other hand, progress is often made by doing something really challenging. So we have to agree on somehow to, to work, to, to, to move towards each other. Again, my field was electron scattering originally, and this is what happened. People came together, you know, they said, well, we can calculate this, we can measure that. It didn't agree. But then slowly but surely people overlapped. And so what I would like to see, to be honest, in, in many of these experiments is a better characterization of the laser pulses. So we are basically told, you know, we sort of have, we, we, we guess the peak intensities and we think we sort of have a Gaussian, but we don't really know and it's not pretty reproducible. And, and we have a focal uh, point uh, and you, you should average over it and you know, average over it like this but we don't really know whether that is the correct way because they don't know enough about this. So I think what I would really like to see from experiments is, is a better characterization of these laser pulses so that, that, that it's not a matter of us having too much freedom uh, as, to be honest, we had in this uh, experiment with the dichroism on the helium plus. Uh, there, there were basically, we, we, tweet, we, we, we twisted some parameters around so that uh, it, it kind of looked good um, at the end, right? Now, in principle, we would say we as theorists should be able to do this, right? Now, there were additional issues were that the pulse was quite long. Uh, Nicolas Duguay gave a beautiful talk at Daymop that you should listen to, and he, he did, made a lot of progress on this. But that's really the point that, that I'd like to see is that the experimentalists know a little bit more about their actual experiment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very, very, very good, good, good answer. And with this, I, I'd like to, to finish this session that was very enjoyable. Thank you very much, all the speakers. I'd like to involve all the attendees in some way. It's difficult through this environment. But at least uh, can I ask everyone to raise their hands if you like the session, please? Now, thank you.